And I believe we also have a very short video because we're trying to have different formats through here. This is going to be two minutes. Is it teed up or not? Um, you can say yeah. 10 seconds. Yeah, I cannot say 10 seconds. Uh, you have to. Okay. So, uh, you know, we put this video uh, for this conference um, because uh, I was struggling with the, um, with the title of the conference, Arkady, you know, because uh, I began to realize that, uh, you know, big data, machine learning, and business challenges, everybody understands it differently. So before you will watch this video, I want to explain how I, you know, uh, translate these terms. So for me, whether you agree or not, that's what I thought, you know, when we put this video together for you. Uh, so big data for me is uh, to process uh, huge masses of data uh, quickly with the speed and mostly with basic but clever statistics. Machine learning is more complex analysis that will allow us faster, make better decisions or better predictions and challenges or opportunities you will see in this video. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and then we will introduce the other two speakers in a moment. Lights, action, camera. Video. Video. Yes. I say something and it happens. It's amazing. Yeah, this video about uh, how we will change the dinosaur industry, learning from uh, people like uh, Amazon, Google, um, and uh, Facebook. Yesterday, Tom Anders, who runs Aerobus, talked uh, here in Berlin, and he said that competition for Aerobus is not in Seattle anymore. It's not Boeing. It's Facebook, it's Google, and it's Amazon. So hire Rolf immediately. What if every time you stepped in your car, you had a mechanic with you? and he looked under the hood before you hit the ignition, then watched every system until you arrived at your destination. That's what happens every time a 787 Dreamliner flies. No other airplane in the sky is monitored this much. Every detail from cabin temperature to air speed is sent straight to an operations control center near Seattle, Washington. A team of experts monitors up to 140,000 data points on every one of the nearly 100 Dreamliner planes. From the time their engines turn on, until they turn off, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. 140,000 data points times 100 planes in the air, that's 14 million data points. 14 million data points times the more than 40,000 787 flights so far is, well, a lot. Needless to say, the op center is getting pretty smart. Individual flight data is compared to the entire fleet of 787s. The Ops Center can then analyze the fleet's data to provide an even better Dreamliner flying experience. And this can lead to future innovations. It's like your mechanic having a team of experts monitor your car's data and compare it to all other cars like it. But how does this help you, the passenger? Since every 787 has the unique power to tell on itself when any issue, no matter how small, needs to be addressed, ground crews can be ready to go as soon as the plane touches down. The data points help them identify precisely what and where the issue is, so no time is wasted trying to figure out the source. Picture your car having its own on-call pit crew, ready, waiting, and aware of the exact condition as soon as you pull into your garage. Now, imagine your car traveled as much as a 787, several different routes every day in different conditions. You'd want some support. The 787 Dreamliner, like all commercial airplanes, is a workhorse. Despite a busy schedule, and thanks in part to its comprehensive monitoring, it has performed remarkably well since its debut in the sky. And the more than 10 million Dreamliner passengers are experiencing fewer delays. With 28 times more data being transmitted than ever before, the 787 poised to become one of the most reliable aircraft in the sky today. That's pretty impressive when you think that Dreamliners have already covered 47 million miles all around the world. That's the distance from Earth to Mars. Can your car do that? Thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, we, we, we did it because yeah, Esther spends 90% of her time on our airplanes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this panel is about how machine learning enables you to change business models. And I'm going to ask Sergey one question, but then I want to introduce Evan and Abe. Uh, and so my question is, there are companies that now sell, instead of selling washing machines, they sell washing services. And uh, Uber, you know, you heard companies that don't own any cars, but they are a taxi service, and Airbnb doesn't own any hotels. Could you see, maybe not precisely that business model, but a business model where if your plane did not fly, you had to refund money to United Airlines or something like that? Are you doing anything like that? Well, that's a very interesting question, you know, and uh, airline industry, I think, transforming as much uh, faster than uh, OEMs, your manufacturing industries. And this is a question, you know, actually more to the airline, you know, than to us. Uh, for people who produce aeroplanes, uh, who design, produce, uh, and service aeroplanes, the interesting question is uh, where we can actually make money. And, um, you know, before we were making money selling aeroplanes, uh, and we think that in future we will make way more money with higher margins selling services. And, uh, you know, that's actually something that happened already with engine industry because engine companies, you know, GE, UT, United Technologies and others, they sell engines at cost and then they make all the money on services and they're way more digital and way more big data and machine learning uh, oriented than us because of this. So moving forward, we think that we will make a lot of money adding value to airlines and passengers uh, with digital services. And that's why, you know, I asked my question, you know, at the other panel, because the only one way how we can um, penetrate this business, just think about this, that's almost $1 trillion business per year. Airlines in the world spend for their okay. operations one, you know, $713 billion will be $1 trillion. So if we can find a way how we can improve their efficiency, either through fuel or through uh, maintenance or through uh, crew scheduling or through um, uh, health, airplane health management, something that was in this okay. movie, there is hundred millions of dollars made. now how airlines will use this money, coming back to your question, it's up to them. If they will decide, for instance, to compensate people uh, that didn't make it because of bad weather, uh, it's up to them. But we think that with machine learning, with big data, we can actually uh, decrease the risk of big data, you know, um, staying on your way to get from point A to point B. And that's what we're working on. Thank you. Um, Evan, so disclosure, I'm on the board of Yandex, I'm also on the board of Meetup, and Evan is, works for Meetup, but he also worked for Orbitz. So if you can briefly explain who you are and then talk about business models at Orbitz and at Meetup really quickly. Sure. And um, then we'll do more questions and then we'll do Q&A. Uh, so I'm a machine learning practitioner. I actually, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, as you might be able to guess from my beard. Um, and, and I'm not an engineer. <laughs> and I'm an engineer, too. Oh, I believe engineers cannot have beards. I just, I, I, a lot of suits in here today. Um, no, but so uh, I, I think what's really exciting uh, is not just, you know, the, the new businesses that are going to start because of machine learning. Um, if I knew you know exactly what those businesses are I would just go do that probably um, but we can really get so much better at everything because of machine learning and uh, so what we've done at, at orbits and uh, at meetup especially uh, is to make what we do better by using machine learning so at meetup we try to connect people that have similar interests we try to get knitters to find other knitters and machine learners to find other machine learners snowboarders to find snowboarders and we used to, you know, just kind of hope that people would tell us what they were interested in. And now what we're trying to do is actually infer what people are interested in and find the best ways to connect people. And so just be a little more concrete. Do you do that by inspecting their Facebook accounts? Do you do it by looking at what they search on? I mean, what, what data do you use 
to produce the insights? Sure. Um, so we still have a graph of the specific interests that people have uh, told us they're interested in, but we find that a lot of what determines what someone wants to meet up about, we can infer from the people that they know. So we, we use your Facebook graph. Your friends are obviously going to be likely to be interested in the same things that you are. Uh, location is a huge factor, so you want to meet up close to you, and people that are near you are also likely to be interested in the same things as you again. Um, we pull in as well your, your search history, so finding what you search for. If somebody starts a group, uh, a meetup later on that you searched for in the past, you definitely want to hear about that. And how much do you look at, I mean, there's the business model of finding people to meet up physically. There's also another part of the business model is which meetup is doing well, which meetup needs help. Uh, how do you, at some point, if we had good enough data, we would help suggest locations. That was the original business model, and it didn't work. Uh, yeah, so uh, there, there's some really exciting things that we're hoping to do uh, in terms of a, uh, getting really good about venues and finding where people want to meet up. Uh, there's also the question of sort of spontaneously starting meetups where they, they should be. Um, currently, every meetup is started by somebody who's brave enough to go out there and do it. And hopefully through machine learning, we can figure out, okay, there's somebody could definitely start a group in this location and meet up at this time, and people are going to show up, and something special is going to happen. And you do it in advance? You, you, you do it before, actually, you know, the question arises, right? So. Well, that's what we're hoping to do, yeah. We're, yeah. Still, we're still figuring out how to do that kind of spark meetups. But. Yeah, I mean, just to clarify, meetups are not real time. They occur in real time, but they're planned in advance. Yeah. Well, I, Esther, I can tell you why I asked the question. Because, you know, yesterday a good friend of mine told me a very interesting story which is related to this. So he is a celebrity, you know, a very well-known uh, in the world person and very well-known in the Internet. He was late in San Francisco to his flight to one uh, very famous airline. I cannot name this airline. Just two minutes. And he was so mad that he didn't make it. He tweeted you know, are uh, that he didn't make it by two minutes and this airline didn't allow him to get on board. Two minutes. He stand next to, to the gate. In one minute, he got the uh, email and SMS. Airline apologized, gave him a secret code and invited him back to the gate. And he was welcomed on board. So I uh, was so amazed, uh, you know, flying to this conference that I called uh, digital marketing guys at Boeing, and they told me that that airline was the first who invented this kind of uh, predictive services internally for them. So because that guy had on his Twitter, you know, thousands of followers, they couldn't stand yeah. that the airline will lose reputation. So they predictively, you know, uh, created the list of people whom they will do anything you know, okay. they probably could delay a flight, you know, for five minutes just to get him on board. And that's how the airlines right now use your algorithms and big data to, uh, to, to save the business and to sell, uh, to sell more and win competition. But I cannot name the airline because I was told that they think it's uh, their huge competitive advantage. Um, interesting. The, what? <laughs> Yeah, look up celebrity. It was not for celebrity. They told me okay. that, you know, any person who shows up in the internet, like... How, many, how many Twitter followers do you well, need you to know, get I, that well, service? So, and then so, let's I, so, so, I, I, so I asked this question, you know, and yeah. I said that, you know, Michael Jackson uh, of today doesn't fly commercial airplanes. What they told me, that they will do the same for me, they will do for the same for any of you who showed up in internet, you know, recently, you know, certain number of times, whether you are an important scientist or a high-level manager or just uh, like Esther, highly, uh, uh, highly valued customer for all the airlines because she just travels so much, you know. She is a rich okay. lady and she travels so much. Uh, interesting. You can find out how important you are the next time you miss your flight if they come <laughs> pick you up. Abe, talk a little bit about there yourself. is only one airline that began to do it, you know, yeah. for all the passengers. I'm going to have drinks with him later and find out. Hi, I'm Abe. I have neither a Twitter account or a beard. Um, <laughs> but uh, I uh, manage a data science team at FNexus, and we're an advertising technology provider. Um, pretty much when a web page loads, the ad you're about to see gets sent to an exchange like FNexus where uh, algorithms, or I like to think of them as robots, 
have bids on them and the ad goes to the winning bidder. So what our team does is we uh, write the algorithms that decide kind of where to buy and how much to bid. Um, machine learning is very important because we transact billions of times a day. Uh, older heuristics just kind of rely on the law of large numbers. If you aggregate enough features and just bid the average and the aggregate, you're not far off. Um, but with machine learning, you get much more return on investment by bidding smartly. Um, it's kind of given rise to uh, new business models in that we have a bunch of expert users who are intermediaries between actual advertisers and our exchange who use our tools, our machine learning tools, to kind of bid smartly and deliver value. So fundamentally, if I'm a publisher and I have stories that are attractive to rich people who buy expensive liquor, I want to, sell, I want to put those ads in front of precisely those people and not waste them on you know, poor women who don't buy expensive liquor. So on the other hand, those poor women who don't buy expensive liquor do buy makeup. So I want to make sure that the most valuable customer hits the most valuable inventory, right? So the average price of everything goes up. Yeah, uh, it's true. I mean, there's an entire like ecosystem of uh, data management platforms that do this kind of segmenting where they look at people's online behavior and place into groups or pull in other metadata to try to kind of guess at their uh, demographics and that segmenting goes into uh, our algorithms in our system and helps determine like what's the probability someone that this person who may see your ad, what's the probability that they're going to go, go to your website and go uh, convert, you know, buy something. And so just, just like the question for TripAdvisor, are these categories human curated or do they emerge through neural nets that say these people do well on this platform or something? Uh, so it's, it's not that sophisticated um, in that it's really, there's not much human curation, it's just purely like empirical and we don't necessarily have that much insight into the how or the why, it's all correlative. So it just works. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't just work always. Um, a lot of what we do actually, there's kind of interesting because there's been so much dispute here over like uh, the technique, I guess, you know, neural net support vector machine. For us, the most mileage really is out of kind of intelligent feature engineering and not necessarily the regression model that it goes into. And that is how can we go ahead and take all these weak signals and tease them out and engineer them to get something predictive, whether it's going into a regression, neural net, or whatever. It's really the kind of the feature engineering, figuring out what's important, what's predictive, and how to combine them. So in other words, which data to use? It's that. What is relevant data? Yeah. Yeah. Which so it, it's two which steps. It's not just w it's which data to use. Like, what are the predictors? And then, given that these things we're going to use, kind of, how should we engineer or combine them or kind of guess at new yeah. functional forms? Like, is it, you know, a simple linear model or is it like the log of that predictor that's even more powerful? And how much do you use users' online behavior versus, you know, it's raining today. We should sell umbrellas or. Yeah, so at AppNexus, most of what we do internally at AppNexus is based on uh, URL and kind of the features of the ad and some rough heuristics for user, how many times they've seen the ad, frequency, recency. Mm -hmm. um, because we're kind of the technology provider, we don't necessarily have that first party insight into someone's particular business that they're advertising for. So then we have like this separate set of capabilities where we allow users to input their own algorithms so they could use their own customizable data. And in that case, that's when you get into the more kind of, we think these people based on our business are gonna be interested in this and they insert that data. And a lot of that's based on uh, kind of looking at who's visited their website. And do they tend to be right or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we beat, we beat a guy with the spreadsheet. The kind of the universal truth we never really know. Uh, yeah. So yes, we, you know, we do it. So I want to ask each of you the same question and then open it up so that we can have, you know, I don't know what interests you, so we will find out by asking you. If you could get one other large data set to use in your business, what would it be? 
you know, what would really make a difference that your your customers or your people don't provide you? I mean, it's impossible to get, but like offline purchasing behavior. Okay. Like I think like uh, they you, would never. You can get that from credit card companies. <laughs> yeah, but they have it, and that's you know such a powerful data set. But um, can they legally give it to me? Is that going to fly with their customers? That kind of thing. I would love to have yeah. like actual offline purchasing behavior. Um, you can get permission for some. I mean, not for everybody, but that, I mean that's what that's what I asked. What would you like to get? Not are you allowed to? That's it, Evan. Uh, I think a big one for us would be where people go, where they spend their time. So it's so hard to know. We should be doing a better job of tracking where people are using our app, but there's you know quest privacy questions regarding that. But I think a big thing for us would be to know you know where where do people want to meet up. So do a deal with Foursquare or something. Yeah, with, or with the or cell phone data or something like that. With the like customers' that. consent. Yeah. So I can. Um, answer this question uh, by telling you uh, about my dream you know so I have a dream uh, to apply the big data and machine learning um, knowledge to something that is very very uh, low probability and I can explain to you what this problem is maybe you have an idea how to help it today uh, if you fly uh, the probability that you will uh, die you know because of the fatality is extremely low. It's the most reliable industry in the world. In the last 10 years, uh, 0.6 flights from 1 million ended up with fatality for every reason, excluding terrorism. You know, mostly it's the human mistake. So what I was thinking about, and I actually launched a project, you know, and I hope Yandex will help me with this project, that if we can collect the data from all the simulators in the world, you know, and from all the cockpits in the world, we can finally attack this very, very small probability of fatality. And if we can reduce it just by a factor of two, then uh, your chances to die on the aeroplane because of fatality will be two times less. What is the problem? The problem is that aeroplane right now is extremely reliable, and the pilots are actually well trained. And it's very, very difficult, you know, to um, make a fatal mistake. But it happens because sometimes absolutely unpredictable, unusual combination of human errors and errors in the uh, codes or control codes, and not likely, but sometimes problem with the structure can happen. The combination of them is impossible to predict. But if we can have access to all the data from simulators from all parts of the world for years. And if we can have access to the data from cockpits that we will have because of 787 technologies, mm -hmm. moving forward, we can make uh, the flight on the aeroplane absolutely safe. Because we will predict, you know, based on not uh, science, uh, sorry, Professor Vapnik, you know, not on a good violin, but just on the truth of life. What's this unusual combination of factors that can lead to fatality? Why is it so important right now? Because various countries like China and India, where we have to train thousands of pilots, and these people never drove even a car. They drove only bicycles or they just walked. You know, there is so big growth. We will train them, but they are not that experienced, you know, as uh, people who uh, lived in other environment. We call them virgin pilots, virgin pilots, the pilots who never did anything driving, you know, before they got the license. This is uh, whom we want to analyze. And if we will get access to this data, then your flight will be way more reliable. And so would you personally rather fly with a virgin pilot or in a UAV? When you will, when you will w walk on the board of my or Airbus or Bombardier or any airplane, you shouldn't worry about this. Because you should be absolutely sure that we as the industry, because we're a dinosaur industry and we take huge responsibility for safety and reliability, and that's why there is not many of us. We're a boutique industry. There is only a few people who produce airplanes. We will take care of this, either through the combination of the most reliable software, the most reliable well-trained pilots, or using the big data, you know, avoiding any impossible, you know, combinations of uh, factors that will lead to fatality. Okay. 
Uh, what about the two of you? Would you rather sit in a Google driverless car or drive yourself? I'd rather drive myself. <laughs> Evan? Uh, in, in traffic, I'd rather be driverless for sure and just chill. One thing about the Google driverless car is they say, well, it's gotten to accidents, um, but they're when the other cars don't behave <laughs> in the logical way it expects them to. And I think that kind of speaks to... But, but the cars already talk with each other. So in the next five years, you know, that will be, you know, a very weak argument. You know, I think that we should look 20, 30 years from now. What I'm talking about with my dream, it probably will happen, you know, in 20 years, okay. but it's a good dream to have. All I know is I don't drive and I sit next to drivers all the time and I'd much rather be in a driverless car. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's have some audience questions. Or I can keep asking. Oh, okay, over there. Okay. I'm going to keep control here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bordan Wisniewski from Yandel's Data Factory. I have a question to Mr. Kravchenko. You said you are old industry. Uh, so can you advise new industry like us how to make money? How to make money on, with data? Sell it to old industry. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we struggle ourselves, you know, with this question because, you know, we, we launched the big project called Digital Airline. It has to be seen. Uh, will we make money? We think we will. You know, and I think that the, uh, you know, we need to learn from each other. You know, I from the side can give you a few advices when I look at your industry, you know. So I began to realize that big data and predictive analytics can be as big industry uh, in the next 20 years as uh, IT outsourcing. You know, let's call IT outsourcing. So 30 years ago, we wrote codes inside the companies ourselves, right? Then uh, IT outsourcing boom happened. How did it happen? It happened for two reasons. One, it happened because of internet and uh, because people in India, you know, uh, cost-effective uh, solutions could work at night when New York slept. But it also happened because of the uh, fantastic marketing uh, success, which is called the year 2000 uh, disaster. So the world was uh, scared, I think, by very smart marketeers by this, and Indian IT outsourcing companies grew like crazy because of this. So my first advice to your industry, if uh, big data and uh, predictive analytics will be an industry, is uh, to think about this event. You know, so, uh, and th this event actually already happened in the security world, but everything related to security will be very captured inside the governments or inside the big companies. So for people like Jane or, or, or Arkady, it will be difficult to make money on this offering outsourcing. But if you will create something, you know, like a yet a thousand uh, threat that I believe was created, you know, uh, um, artificially, then you can have a huge boost to your services and you will be ready with algorithms or with people, with, uh, um, you know, with, uh, with solutions. The second thing that I think you, know, you should uh, really um, pay attention to, everything that I heard, you know, uh, and I regret that I was not with you, you know, for a couple of days, everything I heard this morning uh, just reinforces my personal belief that uh, subject matter expertise, feature engineering, is way more important than violence that uh, you all know how to create. So you need to begin to talk with your customers the same language. And there is no better way how to just uh, get uh, under their skin and team with them. So that's what we try to do with Yandex on a few of our pilot projects when our subject matter experts and your machine learning experts work together if you will build the trust, then it can uh, lead to money. And finally, I think that the other thing that uh, you need to learn from IT outsourcing industry is the power of vertical um, expertise. So, for instance, Esther is on the board of the company called Luxoft, you know, a very good uh, Russian IT uh, success company, Russian-born IT success company now based in Switzerland. They're making money more than anybody else right now because they focus on the three major verticals. They became experts in finance better than major banks. They became experts in automotive industry better than many of the you know, German-based companies. And they became experts in telecom. 
So that's what I think, Arkady and Jane, you know, my advice will be to you, you know, if you want to really penetrate this as a business, you need to build uh, the expertise in a few of the vertical domains. And my job is to excite you with my movie that I made specially for you, that one of these domains is aviation. Thank you. Uh, we'll do the best. More questions, so, please? Yeah, I have, a question. I have a question for Abe, and then we are looking for more questions. But since I don't see hands up, uh, one of the big challenges in advertising is attribution. It's knowing, was it because of this ad or the other ad or because they saw something in the street? Are you doing anything along those lines? Because that's a more interesting data problem, try, trying to understand the intersecting. Oh, yeah, it would be helpful if you had a mic to answer. Yeah, so, you know, right now, in place is kind of this industry very simple model to where it's um, last touch attribution. So you could see, you know, 500. Can you just explain what that is? Does I'm everyone sorry. know what last touch attribution is? So the or idea is, yeah. you know, attribution is, okay, you saw an ad, you purchased the product, how can the advertiser and the publisher credit that purchase to the ad you had seen, to which ad you saw or any ad at all? Um, and right now the standard is last touch attribution, which just means that the last ad you saw, the last ad served to you gets all the credit. Um, now we know that's not true. And I think where the future is going to go is that a bunch of ads are going to get fractions of credit. And to a certain extent, you know, we never really know offline, or at least no time soon offline, what is happening. But I think we're going to move more towards where instead of just one ad getting the credit of the models, where there's fractional attributions to ads, and then also checks now is to see if you actually viewed the ad. Um, that's even a pretty nascent technology we have now to kind of measure if the ad you saw, if the ad that was served on the web page is one you actually saw. So. Uh, one reason I find this interesting is because in the healthcare industry, which we're not really covering today. That's that's a huge issue. You know, did you get sick because of what you ate, because of who you sat next to, because of your genes, uh, because of your diet? Yeah, I think and for our problem space, there's a willingness to accept kind of uncertainty in these things. Because yeah, I mean, purchasing something is not the same as getting sick. It's just not as important to your life. Oh, it is if you're an <laughs> advertiser. But anyway, um, we have a question from Jennifer. Um, hi, I'm Jennifer Schenker from Informula Magazine. Um, this morning I was talking to several participants and, and they told me that they feel like data exchanges are the next big thing because, you know, as, as people use machine learning to identify um, valuable data sets, they, they realize also they're missing some others and, and that they can create businesses by um, selling some of their data to other businesses. But, what do the panelists think need to happen for these data exchanges to be set up? I mean, are there technical issues, regulatory issues, privacy issues? Who sets them up? Who Intellectual controls? property issues? Yeah. So who, who sets them up and who, who monitors uh, the compliance? Um, they kind of exist in a way already. Uh, I, I don't know who monitors the compliance, but... You know, we have third-party data providers who actually segment users and take, you know, people's cookies and place them into these clusters or segments and then sell their services to advertisers. Um, the actual legality or even, like, accepted ethics of it, you know, I don't think anyone really fully understands or knows yet. There certainly are such exchanges uh, in the U.S. insurance industry. There, there's lots of ways you purchase de-identified data where you can have different sets of information. The, the issue is around the, the security of the de-identification and, but you're right, the short answer is it's complicated. The long answer is complicated. Well, <laughs> you know, in, in, in the dinosaur industry, like aviation, for instance, data is extremely well regulated. And, you know, we sit on a lot of data, but one of the problems, for instance, working with uh, the companies like Yandex Factory is that uh, we uh, are not allowed to give them uh, data because 
much of this data is uh, either proprietary or it's airline owned. So if the world will become more uh, uh, trust in each other, you know, then the world will be much better and we can use, uh, you know, this to make things uh, more efficient. But at this point of time, data is gold, you know, and people who sit on data uh, have big problems to give this data uh, to uh, companies who know how to make predictions or how to help. And that's why, you know, my advice was to get closer to the customers either through the joint ventures or through very, very special projects when you can actually, like Accenture model, you know, Accenture, when they provide the services, you know, they make a lot of money not just on outsourcing but on secondment. You know, they will give you uh, people who will become part of your company for two, three years with their technologies and their solutions. And then when they will train your people, you know, they will go away. Go away. So this kind of business models, you know, I think... Uh, will be a bridge to a much uh, more open world. And there's another example, and then there's a question back there. Uh, again, in the health area, Open Humans is a crowdsource platform where individuals can upload their genetic data, their microbiome data, whatever they want. And it is terrifying the medical establishment who think the data is, you know, either untrue or shouldn't be published or whatever, but I think you're gonna find in a lot of industries, you're gonna have more users who benefit from the openness of such a platform, horrifying the people who own the intellectual property. Um, it's a question um, mainly for Sergey and of course the panel. Put, put your... Um, so, in t I mean, you talked about collecting data from the plane itself. But about the uh, consumers that sit in the plane, the customers, yeah. like for example, is there any sort of trend in the airline industry about collecting people's health data while they're sitting for six hours or something? Yeah. And I mean, generally trends of that nature, is this something that is um, a thing in the Absol airline industry? Ab absolutely, but uh, I try to bring up the example that we are working on as the manufacturer. Airline industries, they work on this as well. If airline industries will uh, join uh, us, we can uh, do a much better services for the final customer who is a passenger. If it's infotainment, you know, if for instance use the same technology that I just described, you know, uh, helped my friend celebrity yesterday, you know, uh, we can actually, when you get on the nine hour flight, know about you so much that you don't need to uh, choose from your screen, you know, uh, what BA recommends. We will recommend to you only what you are interested in. We will know that you are interested in boats, you know, in uh, certain books, you know, or you only want to look at James Bond, you know, uh, films, you know, it will be right on your screen. It's easy to do, but there is barriers there, you know, because uh, it means that the, wor the world have to be much less regulated. Some people use the word ethics, you know, she uses the word intellectual property, term the intellectual property. Some people use the word ethics on the way of this kind of services. So I think it will come. You know, we just need to wait either for the event, like year 2000 event, or just wait a little bit and it will come. But so we, example, you know, we, 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 we think about this a lot. So for example, um, there are a lot of point of care testing devices in healthcare that you can give a drop of blood and it can analyze a lot of things for you. And um, so, do you see a, a, a flight experience being that you enter the flight, there's always a nurse or paramedic in the flight, you're going to be from London to New York six hours, you might as well do a checkup, a couple of Q&A and so on, and airline becomes an owner of health data. Well, y y well, you know, I don't know that we go so far, but you know, but uh, one of the things that we right now provide using the e-enabled aeroplanes like 787, you know, we have only 300 aeroplanes flying, you know, that are so much e-enabled. In 20 years, there will be 20,000 more aeroplanes like this flying. And each of them will have capability to do things like you just described. But even today, the pilot and the flight attendants on the aeroplane through our services can have way more information that will not only help them uh, to get faster and better to the final destination from the storm or from the weather prediction. But they also will have the data about uh, the passengers, about their experience. If that data was loaded, you know, in the internet, that will help, for instance, if you have a heart attack, to identify in the seat 3B, you know, a heart surgery uh, doctor from uh, Iran who will save your life.
You understand what I mean? You know, that's, our, that's a vision. But for that, the collaboration between the industry and airlines and the passengers should be on the different level than it is right now. But I think you have capabilities to do that through telecom experiences. Um, maybe Meetup could start having a paramedic at each Meetup. Sure. <laughs> I, I wanted to mention vis-a-vis -vis the, the previous panel, and then I, we have to close because Xenia is looking at me. Uh, there, is, there are now insurance companies that, with the users, the customer's consent, monitor your driving and give you discounts on your insurance if you are yeah, maybe AIG. There's another startup called Go that does this. But if or maybe Andreas from Allianz can answer your question. Anyway, uh, no? you want? <laughs> no, no. Th there was no question. We were just saying people like you are are basically if you monitor a person's driving and they drive well, you give them a discount on their insurance. And if they don't drive well, at some point you invite them to join a different insurance company. <laughs> okay, any, any final words from... Well, first of all, this is typically when in use currently, it's a, it's a very simple model. It's based it's a rule-based system based on a couple of data points. And it's not really you drive well, it's whether you brake a lot or not. And uh, it not really at the moment translates very well into, into claims. And what we develop is a much broader machine learning based approach to that. And that has much deeper uh, data and insight into the behavior. And then again, the only problem is data privacy and ethics again, but it's not that simple. Yeah, I, I mean, there's no privacy involved if the customer openly decides you can no, have all is. my data. No, it is because you open up data that you don't understand as a customer. The trajectories are really very rich data. Yeah. So it's not only the, the behavior, as you drive and where you go, uh, all these trajectories tell a huge story about your life and your personality. Yeah. That's a big thing. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you, panel. Thank you, audience, for your contributions. And it's now time for lunch. Thank you very much.